Friends, I'm in Bhutan, a country where the most important measure of success is the happiness of the local population. The most amazing thing is that electricity is free here. Communism has come to this country. Kings rule here. There are pictures of the royal family at the top and their children at the bottom. Oh my, what is this? Buddhist monks have a say in politics. It is surprising how much what the tourists see differs from real life. The main local saint has a reputation of a lover boy. They have red penises instead of preserves and sanitary towels. The energy is so green that the country destroys more carbon dioxide than it produces. They say we have no carbon footprint. Of course, you have no industry. Let's see where all this happiness comes from and if the locals are really happy. Quite a groom. One of the symbols of Bhutan is the Golden Buddha. It's actually made of bronze, but it is gold-plated at the top. It's called Buddha Dordenma, or a strike of diamond lightning. It is 2,500 meters above the sea level, and inside there are 125,000 little Buddha statues. It's a Buddhist Russian doll. All golden, very beautiful. Oh, they have flowers and pots. Everything is looking good. Closed. Well, okay. Bhutan was a closed country for foreigners for a long time. It opened only in 1974, and it was almost impossible to come to Bhutan independently, just until recently. All tours here were run by special guides, who were given a special license by the state. In addition, there used to be a minimum travel cost for which a tourist could enter the country. After the coronavirus pandemic, this requirement was dropped, but they increased the deposit required to stay in Bhutan to $200 per night. If you want to come, you have to pay. When you apply for a visa, each night costs $200. This is not taking into account hotels, guides, car rentals, and everything else. You have to pay $200 a night, and that seems to me to be the most expensive visa out there. I came here for three nights, and my visa says three nights only, and that visa cost me $600. Plus, there's an additional tax. The tax is considered an environmental tax, and it goes toward the local nature. But Bhutan residents restricts not only tourism, but also contacts with the outside world. Bhutan only joined the UN in 1971, and doesn't yet have diplomatic relations with most countries in the world, including Russia. However, it does have diplomatic relations with, for example, Tajikistan, Armenia, Eswatini, and Fiji. Bhutan has embassies in only six countries in the world, and in Bhutan itself there are only embassies of the neighboring India and Bangladesh, and for some reason, Kuwait as well. Moreover, Bhutan isn't easy to get into. There is only one international airport in the country. According to data in 2010, there were only eight pilots in the world authorized to fly to Bhutan, all because landing is extremely difficult. The plane has to literally glide between the mountain peaks, flying between the mountains, and it's really amazing. It circles a few times in front of those mountains to land at the airport. There is only one local airline. Nobody else flies here. Only Bhutanese pilots can handle the difficult flying conditions. Well, now I've arrived in Bhutan and have seen the Buddha, I can start showing you around. Of course, let's start with the airport. The interesting thing is that even the airport building is built in traditional style. Traditional decorations everywhere. Windows, banisters, pillars, canopies. It says it was opened in 2015. We enter and here we see simply, welcome to the kingdom of Bhutan. This is the most beautiful passport control in the world. I don't know if I can film here. This is what the baggage claim area looks like. It's not just a belt with some simple ads. And mind you, there are almost no ads here. Just a few duty-free ones. While you wait for your bags, you can contemplate this wonderful punarka. Zong model. It's quite a masterpiece. Again, normally at the airport we see ads, people, lots of things. But here, they have an exhibition. An exhibition of stunning photographs. 
И ожидая свой багаж, можно посмотреть на невероятные горы этой удивительной страны. Landing and waiting for your luggage, you can look at the incredible mountains of this amazing country. Look at these amazing people. Bhutan's airport may not be the most architecturally modern, but it's probably one of the most beautiful and charming. Look at the beauty that is everywhere. I would like to stay and live here. The only problem is that it is expensive to live here. Look at all these wonderful things. And this is just the airport. These are baggage claim belts. There are models of some palaces, monasteries. It's all very beautiful. And now we're leaving the airport. The weather is amazing. It's sunny. They're waving at us. Look. They're greeting us. Oh, he's probably waiting for me. Hello. I came to one of the best hotels in the city of Pero. It's the city where the international airport is located. And this hotel is recognized by National Geographic as the best traditional style hotel. And it's time to talk about how hotels work here. Hotels are basically divided into two categories. There are five-star ones that are very expensive. They're between 600 and 1,000 at night. And yes, everything is beautiful. You can see why this hotel costs $1,000 a night. The second category of hotels costs $50 to $70. Well, maximum $100 a night. They are, well, quite simple hotels. They aren't in such nice places. There's no garden, there's no lobby area, no restaurants. Well, they ain't that bad. You can live there. I live in one of them. Not the one behind me, no, I just came here to look. I live in the one for $100. No, actually, $70. So here's the biggest mystery. I go to a five-star hotel here to see how people live, how people who stay in hotels like that live. They come here by helicopter because there's a helipad. And you know what? They're all empty. All the five-star hotels are empty. There are, at most, one or two people in this huge hotel. There are no guests at all here now, even though it's considered a good tourist season. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. I came here for breakfast, and the breakfast is totally empty. They're cooking something special for me now. And of course, it's a big surprise. They have unbelievable hotel rates. A thousand dollars a night. There are no people here. They impose absolutely savage restrictions on visiting the country. I mean, to come here, you have to have a lot of money. Just the visa itself is $200. Then you have to hire a guide with a car and a driver. I mean, you can't just hire a guide. You also need a car. At the same time, the guide and the driver must be different people. It's forbidden for the guide to be the driver. You have to take a driver, a guide, a car. That's at least $350 more. So in total, if you come for a week, you'll spend about $2,000 per person. Only very rich tourists can come here. A lot of people are scared because of the prices. And as you can see, everything is empty. Why don't they make it easier for the tourists? Why don't they lower the prices so that people can come here? So that all this infrastructure they've built can actually be used. I don't understand it. It's a mystery to me. Yes, the hotel is amazing. The carvings here are very beautiful. There's an empty restaurant. Nobody is having breakfast. It's closed. They're still renovating it because there's no people here. The lobby is totally empty, but the hotel looks amazing. Look at the atrium. All these columns, it's all carved on wood and painted over. We continue our tour of the hotel. Naturally, there's a picture of the king. No establishment, no house is left without a picture of the king. We're going to explore this beautiful hotel further. So this is what the building looks like. And no, it's not the guests there. In case you thought I had fooled you that there's someone lives here. No, it's just some caretakers walking around with a girl who also works here. This is what the houses where the thousand dollar a night people live look like. This is where bamboo grows. This is where people should be sitting because it's sunny. It's breakfast time. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock in the morning is a good time to have breakfast. But as you can see, there's no one here. The windows here are just amazing. There are some bulls, cows, dragons, and other animals carved in wood. It's all carved, very rich, very beautiful. From the point of view of style, it's really good. Вот с точки зрения стиля, это действительно вообще 
By the way, note this. Here's one of the main features of Bhutanese architecture. Here they built in such a way that the windows always expand out. So at the bottom we have small windows. The higher up we go, the bigger the windows are. Well, all this was built before. You can see here how thick the wall is. It wasn't possible to make big spans, big windows. To prevent the whole thing from collapsing, you could only make big windows at the top. So the lower you go down, the smaller the windows are. And this is the traditional Bhutanese house. It always expands upwards, and at the top there's a roof, which is ventilated. There's an open space there. Here's a local restaurant. There are children playing. Hello, children. How are you? So here, like in Temple Paro, you can directly like uh, talk to them. Uh, uh -huh. Most of our uh, uh. like youth can. Okay, is that uh, meat? Can can we get that one? Okay. And some rice. Anything? I'll do. Uh, make one noodle and two, uh, one fried rice. What we have here is interesting. This is a uh, mountain goat. Mountain goat. Why? Why it's here? It's decoration or... Decoration. Ah. Uh, it's a decoration. Yes, it's a type of decoration. They sell alcohol in the cafes here. There's whiskey, vodka, etc. You name it. No, no champagne. Uh, no, here like people prefer beer or whiskey. A uh, beer or whiskey? Yes. And whiskey is the local whiskey or? Yes, it's the, ah, uh, local. Yeah, it's product. made in Bhutan. Most of the, these products are all from India. Uh -huh. The interior design makes you understand the priorities of the owners. Here's the picture of the royal family. The king, the queen, and the future king. The little prince. Is that the royal family as well? Yes, that's the old king. The new one's over there. All the kings. One, two, three, four, five. The fifth king is the one who rules now. They all look alike. Isn't that the same person? No, that's four. That's five. So here are the last five kings. They're all incredibly beautiful. The last two look alike. Here's a watch with the royal family. This is the king and queen, so young, so beautiful, straight out of a Hollywood movie. And this is the family photo? Yes, this is their family. It's the family that owns this cafe. So the pictures of the royal family are up here, and their children are lower. Oh my, what's this? It's the fur of a wild animal, a wild cat. There are lots of them here. It's hard without coffee here. The altitude is 2,200 meters. The water starts boiling at 92 degrees centigrade, and it's impossible to make proper coffee. Restaurants and cafes are nice, but I'm here to show you Bhutan. We are going to see the city of Peru. Here you can see this two-story house. The roof is always open, because hay and firewood are stored up there. All this was ventilated to keep it dry. And still today, when we look at some traditional house, we see a building, two-story, sloping, and crooked, with a raised roof and a ventilated space. Here's a valet parking. He looks very fashionable. He's wearing Crocs and a puffer jacket. The valet has style. Well, things have changed a bit. When I was in Bhutan 10 years ago, it was the most illiterate who worked as valets. That is, a special job was created so that the people who knew how to do absolutely nothing would have at least a chance to earn a living. Now, apparently the situation has changed and parking is now regulated by some trendy Bhutanese hipsters. 
Here we see a myriad of souvenir shops. Again, note that all the houses, absolutely all of them, are built in this Bhutanese national style. The interesting thing is that all the architectural standards are strictly observed here. That is, not even on your own plot of land can you build a house that does not conform to the general style. This is controlled, and as they say, they can even demolish your house if it is not decorated enough, or if it is different in any way. So even some luxury hotels designed by foreign architects make sure to make references to traditional Bhutanese architecture. One more valet parking. And here, my friends, is Bhutan's main car. The Mahendra Bolero is a pickup, and there are different versions of them. There are four-door ones and two-door ones. They're made in India, and it's probably the most popular Bhutanese car right now. They are, of course, unbelievably ugly, but they're cheap. And since India is the main supplier of all Bhutanese products, they also buy cars from Indians. It's that simple. Bolero pickup, cheap and simple. Oh man, how much? 400. And right here there's fried cauliflower, peppers. It's a good business. There's an interesting story about cigarettes. It's that cigarettes used to be banned in Bhutan. You couldn't smoke. Of course, people illegally used to buy cigarettes and smoke them. But it changed during the pandemic because cigarettes were sent from India and people crossed the border to India to smoke and buy cigarettes. When the borders were closed during the pandemic and there was a real danger that this illegal cigarette trade in India would continue, Bhutanese would contact those with coronavirus and bring it home. So the king wisely decided that cigarettes should be legalized so that people would stop illegally walking the mountains, walking the mountain trails to India, infecting themselves and bringing the coronavirus back to beautiful and happy Bhutan. Since then, since the COVID cigarettes here are, one might say, semi-legal, you can buy them, but they cost a lot. And you can only smoke when no one is watching. Smoking is forbidden in public places, and most Bhutanese do not smoke. And here you see again a pickup, a supermarket. Well, let's go to the supermarket and see what they have. Supermarket. Oh, there's even wine from Australia, made in Malaysia. Most of the products are from Malaysia or India, made in Malaysia. Yes, this is made in India. And this is made of India. Well, almost all the products are imported because nothing is produced in Bhutan. Everything here is written in Russian. Russia, Krasnodar, Krasnodar region. Wow, this coffee was made in Russia, in Krasnodar, and it was exported to Belarus. From Belarus, this coffee somehow made its way to Bhutan. It's an incredible journey. Amazing how Russian coffee, Russian coffee ended up in the shops in Bhutan. This is from India too. So most of the stuff is Indian, but somehow they also have Russian coffee here. Another shop. Of course, there will be portrayals of the royal family here. And these portrayals of the royal family look quite casual. Look, let's count the portraits. One, two, three, four. This one's big. And there's the fifth one over there. Look at how the main street looks, all in the traditional national style. All these roofs, these windows, everything's painted. When you look from afar, it's clear that there's a mess with some signs. But if we go around the corner, this is where the devastation begins. It's a mess. This is what the wiring looks like. And this is what the houses that are not on the main street look like. It smells like a toilet. And here, they're building something new. Oh, 
There are these carved frames, blocks, so it's all in the national style. They dry clothes here. There are some dogs over there. I get an impression that here in Bhutan, they pay a lot of attention to the publicity of the country. I mean, some Ministry of Public Relations. Publicity and promotion in, of Bhutan works better than anywhere else. If you read publicity leaflets, listen to the news, you really think that this is the happiest, most wonderful, greenest country. But in reality, behind all these beautiful words and publicity brochures, there is real life. Bhutan is actually very poor and poorly cared for. It's a country with poorly developed infrastructure, where there is a completely different world for tourists. With luxurious five-star hotels costing $1,000 a night, with restaurants, helicopters and visas that cost $200 a day, and then there's the life of ordinary people. Dirty, uncomfortable, with very bad food and high prices, with a huge number of restrictions. And it's all sad, of course, because the tourists who come here, some of them rich Americans, who don't see all this and probably don't even think about it. When after COVID in Bhutan, they imposed a tourist tax of $200 per night, which, by the way, is the highest tourist tax in the world. The tourism officials here said that they had thought long and hard, revised their tourism policy, and that the money should go to increase the level of services for tourists, and that money should be spent on landscaping, cleaning, and maintaining the ecology of the country. So behind me is the gigantic hall of the local brewery, absolutely empty, which was clearly built to accommodate a lot of tourists. There's no one there, everything is empty. Empty hotels, empty restaurants, it's supposed to be a brewery, it's lunchtime. There should be people, but there's nobody. Anyway, something tells me that greed is what killed them. The tourists stopped coming, even though the country opened up to tourists after the pandemic a few months ago. People don't come running. Partly, I think, it's because of the huge taxes. This is related to tourist expenses. Expensive hotels, expensive guides, expensive cars, and tourist taxes. Everything is very expensive here. We have come to the market. Let's see what they have here. The market is certainly beautiful. You might even think at first that it's made to please tourists. There's even an information center. But considering that there are no tourists here now, it doesn't look like a spectacle. The locals are out to buy something. So now we are in the market with our main goal being to see how strictly people follow the national dress code. You can see that not a lot of people do. One guy is wearing jeans, which is a shame. He's wearing some kind of trousers and leather loafers. This person is wearing a puffy jacket. Well, as far as I can tell, 30% of the people here follow the dress code. The rest are in ordinary civilian clothes. It's a regular outfit, puma, puma jacket, jeans, etc. Look, there's cauliflower, garlic, oh, there's watermelon, tomatoes, onions, pepper, bamboo, Nothing too exotic. People buy everything. Actually, most of the women wear skirts, and the men wear looser clothes. These two wear skirts, one doesn't. The women are a bit stricter when it comes to the dress code. And here are the meat market stalls. What they sell here is cheese. It's yak cheese. That's right, yak cheese. It's dried, smoked cheese. Wow. It looks very tasty. Wow, yak cheese. Okay. There are two types of yak cheese. There's smoked cheese, it's orangey-brown, and there's white cheese. 
It's boiled in yak's milk and then dried. It's in really hard form. It is literally like a stone. You can't cut it. You can't do anything. You can suck on it all day long and it will eventually soften. Then in addition to dried cheese, there's dried fish, dried peppers. I don't understand what they do with the fish afterwards. Then they sell a variety of cereals. Everything is from India. You can see on the bags it says that everything comes from India. Red rice, white rice, some other vegetables, some beans. What is interesting is the people are very different. I mean the people who come to work in the market from the villages, most of them are wearing traditional clothes, both men and women. You can see that they come from the village, and the people who live in the city, they are more progressive. They don't mind. Here you can see a couple in traditional clothes. And here's a guy in fake Louis Vuitton. And here's a guy jeans and loafers. And here are some grannies, also in traditional dress. And next to them are a young woman and a boy, dressed in European style. And here there are also modern-looking young people, and not so modern, and not so young people. And here is the local fast food. Let's see what they have here. Noodles with meat, rice with egg, and meat, noodles with tofu. That's it. This is the market. I didn't find Bhutan a clean country at all. Even when they try to organize sorted waste collection, it's still rubbish. Pardon the pun. This is the first time I've seen an attempt to make separate waste collection bins. The interesting thing is that there's a bin for plastic, for bottles, and for paper. I have a question. There is one bin for plastic and one for bottles. What happens to the plastic bottles? The plastic goes there, all the bottles go there in this bin. And the glass bottles? Here. Then the recycling plant will sort them. What do you do if you have an aluminum can, for example? They recycle aluminum and things like that. Some things don't get recycled, but aluminum and things like that go to the recycling plants anyway. So if you have a kilogram of aluminum, you can take it to a recycling plant and sell it there. That's how some people make a living. I see. Very curious. It says bottles. And there are bottles. In plastic, there's a lot of different rubbish, and in paper, there's some more rubbish. No one really cares. Now, wait a minute. If you start sorting rubbish, of course, you shouldn't do like they do here. You should first give people a very simple choice. When there is a rubbish reform, the first thing people have to do is to start separating recyclable waste from non-recyclable waste. Usually that's plastic, metal, and paper. Everything that can be recycled should be thrown in one bin. And everything that is not recyclable should be thrown in the other. And then little by little, year after year, introduce more and more different bins. When we go to Sweden or Finland, we see a lot of different bins for batteries, for light bulbs, for used coffee capsules. But this is something you have to progress to. When you say, right, the bottles go here, the plastic goes there, etc., people don't understand it. This is a butter lamp house. Long time back, uh, normally butter lamps are like burnt in temper. Mm -hmm. But uh, due to fire hazardness and for safety reason, we want to preserve these old, uh, age-old monuments. So now they have made separate butter lamp house for safety reason. So and then butter lamp representation of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So darkness is kind of ignorance so the light clears the darkness so butter lamp clears the darkness so even uh, our like if you are ignorant and then if you have wisdom then your ignorance is cleared by your wisdom similarly it's kind of representation okay enough with the rubbish in the shops let's go see the fortress The ones in red are the monks. 
the guard, the policeman, doesn't wear a national costume. I don't understand why the police here don't wear national costumes. They're checking the tickets. The guards are warming up inside. You can warm up here too. It's cold in the palace. Here, of course, there's a picture of the royal family, cameras, and here we see this incredible fortress. There's a monkey sitting on an elephant, and a hare sitting on a monkey. Uh, it is a symbol of harmony in a diversity. Mm -hmm. Higher harmony in a diversity. So this story goes back to the uh, time of Buddha in a forest. And then they were, uh, they were fighting over the uh, fruit of this tree. Then one day they came to a meeting, and then they said that, Whoever is the eldest have the more authority to eat this fruit. Then they kept on discussing. Then first the elephant said, when I came to this place, this tree was just my height, and then it was not bearing a fruit also. I ate some leaves of the tree and then I watered it. Then I had more authority to eat the fruit now. Then the monkey says, no, no, no. Then I was earlier than you. When I came here, it was my size. The tree was my size. It was smaller than what you saw. It was younger than what you saw. I ate the young tender leaves, and then I sheep near the root of the tree, and then it grew more. Then taking the rabbit or the hare said, no, 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 I am earlier. When I came here, it was just a seedling, seedling, and then it had only a few leaves. I had that, it was very tender leaves, and then I urinated around, and it was protected from the paste, and then all the things. Then finally the bird says, I was the first who brought the seed all the way from other and then uh, uh, dropped here and then it grew into this tree. Then later on they discussed and then said that we will, the younger one will respect the elders, then the elder one will take care of the younger. So this is like young to elders. So it's kind of like a respecting each other, which is like still. And then with their unity, now they can reach the fruits and then they can take care of the tree. So that is you, uh, harmony in a diversity. So they are mm -hmm. from different, they are different animals, but they live in harmony. So normally they are placed in such kind of, uh, such kind of places, because as soon as the people see, it's the blessing from the side. So this is also same like central tower, and then we have monastic uh, community of monastic body of the Paro district, central district. This side, these are all rooms for like monk body, and then that side we have some offices, and then this is the central tower where there are a lot of temples inside, mm -hmm. and then this is the place in 90s or 80s, one famous Italian director shoot a movie known as Little Buddha mm -hmm. was like made here. Here is the Dakshu Dongda. Dakshu Dongda is the representation, or uh, we call him, he is a governor of the district and then he is the representative of His Majesty the King. And then here is the Royal Court of Justice. So these are all. Then we go down, then there are temples. Now, because of safety reasons, I mentioned that the fortress was burned down in 2020. Mm -hmm. So now, people, now our peoples are careful. So now they bring the butter lamp house outside. So, как тот сгорел, что-то сгорело. stairs are really amazing. It has very steep steps. They are inclined. You have to hold on tight if you go down.
It's an impressive fortress, combining administrative buildings. There's a court, and the mayor sits here with the monks, under one roof beside, behind these thick walls. There's something interesting here. There's some kind of masonry, and people are putting rubbish between the stones. I thought it was a tradition, like the notes in the wailing wall. No, people are pigs, that's all. People hide their rubbish here. I get it when people throw some papers on the ground, it's easy to pick them up. But when instead of using the bins that are here, people put their rubbish under the stones of the wall, what can I say? You're a fool then. There are not many cities in Bhutan, so even in Pero, there's a residence of the king. It's like a second capital city. It's the temporary residence of the king. If he's visiting, he stays in the residence here. Well, now that we've seen the king's residence, we can go on. From Pero, we'll go to Thimphu, the capital of Bhutan since 1955. And before that, we'll stop at one of my favorite places to eat. Note how Bhutan post office looks. It's like almost every building in the country. It has natural motifs everywhere, cornices, decorations, and paintings. This is the entrance to the post office. It gives the impression that it's the entrance to paradise. And of course, the most frequent image is one of the royal family, the king, the queen, and their baby. Here is a calendar hanging inside the post office. It's from the National Bank. It's the royal family in winter. It's so beautiful. They sell postcards, as always, with pictures of the king. And red penises, as usual. What else can there be in the post office? What a great post office. It's the same with the postcards, the king, and the landscapes, the animals, and yes, one symbol of the country is this incredible penis. They offer an interesting service at the Bhutanese post office. You can print stamps with the photo of your choice in a few minutes, and they will be valid so you can actually send letters with them. Look, I have printed myself on a real stamp that you can stick on a letter on a postcard and send it, and it'll arrive, probably. Well, we've seen the postcards, now let's see what they're made of. We are here at a traditional paper making factory, and then uh, traditional paper is made from a tree or plant known as Daphne, and then they make it from the Daphne plant. Here is the soaking area, and then up there is like boil it, uh, to make it into pulp so we can go inside. So these ladies are selecting best bark and then removing the residue and then uh, segregating the best quality uh, bark and then uh, different type of qualities of bark. So after that they will put in put it here and then make it into pulp and then they will mix it there. Uh, they make uh, pulp and then water in there and then they will uh, bring out the pepper uh, on the bamboo, uh, bamboo frame. And then after that, so they will press it here, press it and then it's pressed and then most of the water are like uh, removed from here. The final water is dried on this dryer. Back then, we don't have electricity, so they, most, of the, uh, most of the peppers are dried in sunlight. But today, we have hydroelectricity, and then they came up with an innovation where they made this kind of drying uh, machine. So it's, it contains water, and then water is heated by the uh, uh, electricity, and then we have heating plate here and then they pass it here. After that, when it is dried, then they will remove it and then this is pepper. This is the handmade paper to use as canvas for the paintings, to make books, notepads and postcards.
And now let's go to the city. By the way, Thimphu is one of the smallest capitals in the world. It's unbelievable that in such a small city with so few cars, so few people, there are just 10,000 people here. They can't manage and sort out the traffic. They park as if they don't know how to park. Everything's slow. It's very strange. On the main street, they sell all this Chinese stuff. It looks like that. Of course, the only funny thing is that you pass one side or the other, and the destruction starts. People don't live well here. This is still the city center. This is the central square. The nice thing is that even in modern buildings, as you can see, there are murals, cornices, and columns everywhere. And there is impressive traditional local architecture everywhere. The crossing is perfectly quiet, but you can't cross properly. They've made fences and the crossing is elongated, so we have to go this way, around, and somehow cross the street. He thought we were going to go that way. Of course, we won't. There's an old Toyota, a gift from the people of Japan. The Japanese, by the way, very often give things to different countries. They always mark it with the Japanese flag. Everywhere there will be an indication that it is a gift from the people of Japan. Here, in such a nice booth, and a traffic officer regulating something. This is the main street. The Bhutanese say that they're very proud of ecology, that everything is so green, wonderful, clean, and fresh. But even in the city center, there are some landfills. I don't understand why they're here. I don't think it should be like this. Well, judge for yourselves. Here's Central Street, and someone's taking out their rubbish. Here we go a little bit further away, and we see that everything is piled up with boxes. I don't know. It's not nice. Again, there are signs everywhere that you can't litter. I mean, no defecating, no pooping, no weeing in the corners. It's all forbidden. Let's keep our city clean. Here people don't pee on the street corners, but they are littering. I don't think it's right. Cities, my friends, should be clean. And you can see posters like this. Let's live without plastic. No plastic in our beautiful Bhutan. This is what a taxi parking looks like. Since working as a taxi driver involves wearing the national dress, the taxi drivers are very well groomed. The main vehicle here, it's a Suzuki. Taxis must have yellow roofs. Here is the backyard of the central street. The miracles are coming to an end. The Bhutanese miracle ends. This is where you can see the hairstyles they like to do here. It's all very fancy. They put in exercise machines and made a children's playground. Interestingly, the playground is behind a wire fence. I mean, apparently, it's all so difficult that, at night, when the playground is closed, children sneak in and play, so that there would be no unauthorized access. They made it that way. But you can get in here without any problems. Oh, there's a missing cat. Oh, no. Here the children play, and there's a picture of the royal family over there. By the way, the children don't wear national costumes. Well, almost nobody here does. Only some parents, if before the rules on costumes were strict, now, only some categories of workers have to wear national costume. Guides, taxi drivers, all those who are connected with ministries, and so on. Well, you also have to wear it to come visit some state institutions. This is the official Bhutanese policy, which is planning to get rid of plastic. But if you look at the roadsides, and not at the press releases of the local officials, you can see that getting rid of plastic is still a long way off. This is a mess. The sewers are leaking. It definitely doesn't look like Switzerland. 
Generally speaking, the more time you spend here, the more you are struck by how much the tourist image differs from real life. There are two different worlds. In the world they create for tourists, it's a fairy tale, an amazing country, but in reality, no miracles happen. And here, there is a charging station for electric cars. Here are the electric cars. Before I talk about them, I will tell you about the number plates. The yellow plates are for taxi cars. The red ones with white-blue letters, VR, VP, stands for Bhutan Private, which is a private car. And if they are red with yellow letters, BG, it means it's a Bhutanese government car. If the plates are green with the letters BT, it's a Bhutanese taxi. But it's an electric car, so if it says BP in green, it's a private electric guitar. In Bhutan, they take care of the ecology, so you see some charging stations here. And here, it's just a rubbish dump. It smells terrible. It's just a dump. I don't know what's in there. This looks like a landfill too. But there's a fancy electric gas station here. Next to it, another dump. And another dump. This is full of rubbish. Someone lives there. Let's have a closer look. Anyway, there's someone living in the dump. Workers live there. And here again, electric chargers. It's a Bhutanese contrast. And again, it's interesting. No matter what, you have to respect the traditional style to make it look beautiful. The most surprising thing is that the electricity is free. I mean, if you have an electric car, you can charge it up for free and drive for free. It's a miracle. Everything for the people. Communism has come to this one country. I'm personally, I'm a bit disappointed with the capital, because in some ways I expected more order. In terms of pedestrian infrastructure, it's just a mess. Look, there are some exits, passages, there are no pedestrian crossings. I don't know, there's a lot to work on. Of course, when you go away from some of the main streets and go down a bit where there are simple houses, it's not as cheerful or as nice as the main streets. It's the usual poverty. The only difference is those windows everywhere, that traditional architectural motifs. Here there are no pavement. Yes, it's stone. That's not good, of course. And immediately I have a question. Where do the $200 a night they charge people go to? Tourists come, they pay $200 a night, they could easily fix it with the money. So what's going on? Friends, I am in an ordinary Bhutanese courtyard at the moment. As is often the case, there is an image of the city for tourists, where all the pretty pictures are taken. And there is real life parking on the pavements, broken streets, filthy children, some old grannies sitting by the entrance. There is rubbish everywhere, and of course plastic. Everything is dirty, and nobody cares. They talk so much about ecology, about being the cleanliness and most wonderful country in the world. Maybe it's true about the quality of the air, but there is work to be done. Bhutan's Ministry of Housing and Public Utilities clearly does a bad job. It seems that all the energy goes into work of the Ministry of Happiness. Yes, there is such a thing in Bhutan. Bhutan is the last Buddhist kingdom in the world. So it's still ruled by kings. Yes, a king who had unlimited power, limited it himself, introduced many democratic reforms and then left the throne voluntarily. Many presidents should learn from such a king. But Jimei Sinji Wanchikis' achievements did not stop there. He was the one that came up with the concept of gross national happiness, of which all the country's policies are now based. The king contrasted Bhutan's happiness index with the gross domestic product, GDP, which is usually used to measure a country's economic success. 
Bhutan believes that happiness is more important than wealth and cannot be measured only in material terms. There is also a special commission that monitors the happiness of the Bhutanese. It's called the Ministry of Happiness. It holds meetings in this very building. It's worth noting here that the Ministry of Happiness is very beautiful. First of all, in the courtyard they have some trousers, t-shirts and some clothes drying. It's all very cozy. They park right next to the stairs. There's a courtyard like this, there's bamboo, some old covered scooters, dog kennel, but the dog is gone. It has gone somewhere. My Bhutanese guide was a bit embarrassed. He said, are you sure you want to see what our National Happiness Commission looks like? Here is their sign, GNH Center. Look at the people dressed in national costume. Besides caring about national happiness, the fourth king did a lot of good. He built paved roads, established communications, started a newspaper, he forced everyone to learn English, invited foreign advisors, and sent the best students to study in Europe and the US. Before him, Bhutan was a country isolated from the world, with medieval rules. What the king did in Bhutan can be compared to the Singaporean miracle of Lin Kuan Yu. If Bhutan had been luckier with geography, it would have probably been one of the richest states. Everyone here loves the kings of Bhutan, the fourth and the current one, and they love sincerely. The walls of every house have portraits of the king and queen. They look over their happy people from calendars and postcards, money and posters. The people come back from the countryside. They are happy. What's interesting is that the king himself doesn't, in my opinion, spare himself from vulgar populist PR stunts. He rides around town on a bicycle and then tells everyone that he lives in a small one-story house and eats rice and water. The trusting Bhutanese believe it all and they love their ruler more and more every day. They love the royal family. Moreover, the royal family is incredibly beautiful, just like in Hollywood movies. A gorgeous wife, the king himself, is also handsome. The children, they have just two children. They are wonderful, amazing children. So the photos that the royal palace distributes in calendars, posters, they're not serious portraits which are hung in the offices near some flag and admired. It's simply images of a happy family life. I haven't seen anything like this in any other country. These portraits are not embarrassing to hang at home. And when you have portraits of the royal family in every house, they become, well, they become part of your own family. Because these photos look very much like the normal family photos. When you go to visit someone in Bhutan, you see that there are normal family photos. Children, grandchildren, some friends. And there is a picture of the royal family. And they don't differ much from each other in terms of themes. And the king's family is very interesting, because the fourth king was a naughty boy. The fourth king of Bhutan had four wives, and here you could probably feel sorry for him. Poor guy. Four mothers-in-laws, four wives. But no, he was a very cunning king, so he took four sisters as wives. Yes, his four wives were sisters to each other. I really don't know how a family like that can live like that how they live with all the wives being sisters, and he takes turns to sleep with them. They have children. Anyway, it's all very strange. Apparently, after seeing all this, the current king said, no more polygamy. I have my beautiful wife, the only one, I love her, no more wives. That's why he promised that he would only have one wife. But his family isn't perfect either because the current king has a brother and a sister, and they married the queen's brother and sister accordingly. In other words, it's all in the family. No strangers. Very unusual family customs. By the way, according to the Bhutanese constitution, the king can only rule until the age of 60. This rule was introduced by the fourth king of the country, and the people objected to this decision. But the king said that although he was in favor of democracy, in this case, he wouldn't listen to the people, and limited an age of the rulers. And there are more surprising traditions in Bhutan. So the full moon is 15. Yes, it's 15. So it goes to the end, and then again, 1, 2, 10, 15. Well, I'm going to try to explain what I just heard. 
The guy's laughing because he himself doesn't understand what's going on. First of all, you have 30 days in the lunar calendar. On the 10th, 15th, and 30th, it's illegal to sell meat. On the 15th, it's a full moon. Nobody knows what happens on the 10th day. Probably preparations of some sort. And the 30th is the new moon. Yes, so this only applies to raw meat. You can sell dried meat. You can sell dried meat, but not fresh. Then there's first month and the fourth month when you can't do any meat business at all. You can't import, you can't sell locally. Basically, the whole meat business goes on hiatus. If you think that's it, it's not. You can't drink on Tuesdays. Why can't you? Nobody knows. What's he saying? So people can take a break. Tuesdays are prohibition Tuesdays. No bars, no shops. You can't get alcohol anywhere. But of course, the Bhutanese are not stupid. As I told you, there's this perfect, decorative and beautiful image for tourists, and there's real life. So on paper, nobody drinks on Tuesdays, but in real life, they serve cognac instead of tea. It's okay, everybody drinks. That's how our people cope with local laws. They're just like us. For example, uh, today uh, is a full moon, so all uh, meat shops are closed. Okay, but if you want to buy some meat, you can go to to the restaurant, to the cafe, I don't know, and uh, buy uh, buy meat there. Uh, yes, you can uh, buy so, so uh, meat. Uh, meat. What the, okay, so what the difference if you uh, if you can buy some meat in a restaurant? And uh, why can't you buy it in a regular shop? Uh, well, maybe like uh, because uh, even like uh, on 15th and then this kind of auspicious, we call it auspicious day, people tend to like uh, stop eating meat for like day mm-hmm. or they tend to stop. Okay, uh, somebody stop, for... somebody not. But yeah. uh, also you, uh, you tell me that uh, 95% are the Buddhist and 5% are maybe Muslims uh, so, uh, so, yeah, and uh, they can eat meat uh, every day if, if they want. Yeah. So uh, why they can't buy it in a supermarket? It is uh, one of the rule and regulation from our monastery. Uh, okay, nobody knows. And nobody knows. Also like uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of like to control and then to make people uh, and ha- to make people happy. Как это поет в песне? No meat, no cry. Yes? Yes, I think so. No meat, no cry. <laughs> but uh, yes, I'm true. Like what you think is, I'm also thinking. Even uh, I'm vegetarian. I have been vegetarian for now 21 years. Mm-hmm. In Bhutan, we cannot kill animal and then produce meat on our own. So most of the meat are like imported from India. So we don't know how healthy this meat are. If Buddhist people really want to eat meat and then if there is like meat shops and all this, mm-hmm. why? We uh, can't uh, build a meat house here, which have like proper, uh, proper way of processing and, and healthy meat and all that. So even being myself as a vegetarian, I have that kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. So as long as somebody eats, somebody will definitely kill anywhere. So it's same kill, but only. It's still weird, but maybe the country sometimes bans the sale of meat so that those who don't have the money to buy it won't be sad. Well, in the meantime, I've arrived in Punaka. This is the ancient capital of Bhutan. And this fortress is called Punaka Zoom. This is where Jikenpo, the country's leading Buddhist monk, like a patriarch, lives in the winter. Also, inside, there's a mausoleum of Zabdrung, a monk and artist who lived in the 17th century, succeeded in uniting Bhutan into one country and became its king. And according to legend, they still have a grain of rice. That was the reason why Bhutan fought with Tibet. From this grain of rice, it's carved a statue of Ishwara, an ancient bodhisattva, or the awakened one. It can be roughly compared to a Christian saint or even an apostle. This rice statue was kept in Tibet 
But then a monk whose name I won't even attempt to pronounce stole it and took it back to Bhutan. In a short war, the Bhutanese defended the grain and it's now preserved in one of the towers of this fortress. However, visitors are not allowed to enter the hall more than once a year. So we will not be able to get in there. We will contemplate all this beauty from afar. And this is the traditional bridge. We go to this fortress palace by the traditional Bhutanese bridge. It's beautiful. Right, we should buy some tickets. Also, the bridges, as Bhutan is a mountainous country, and there are many rivers, ravines and cliffs, it was necessary to build bridges. There are two types of bridges here. There are ordinary bridges, where two ropes are pulled and people walk on planks like mountain goats, and there are beautiful and stronger bridges, such as cantilever bridges, where there is a tower on each side. From each tower, two decks start and meet in the middle. These bridges have a roof. The roofs were built over the bridge to make them last longer, because it protected them from the rainfall, and because of that, they didn't have to be repaired so often. This bridge is a work of art. There are many bridges like this one still standing. Most of them have been extensively remade. But again, everything is done in the traditional Bhutanese style. It is very beautiful. There is a wonderful part here. The fence of this bridge, it's carved in wood with paintings over it. Even on the new modern reinforced concrete bridges, the Bhutanese still make some traditional fences. Wow, there's a huge number of fish under the bridge. And here, there's a guy giving treats to feed the fish. And the fish already realize where they're going to be fed. Folks, look at these huge beehives right outside the window. I've never seen such hives like this before. And there are many of these beehives. It seems that some very dangerous bees live there. So we are here at uh, Punaha Zong. Zong means fortress. This uh, Zong was built in 17th century. It is the old capital of Bhutan. Our first king was crowned here in 1907. Today it is the central monastic body and then also like it is the central district administration office of the Punaha, uh, Punaha district. Those days it serves as a fortress. Now it serves as an administrative office and also it is the monastery where monks stay here. Uh, we have a central monastery body which will uh, move towards Thimphu in the summer and then they will come back here in the winter. This is the winter residence for our central monastic body. The central staircase is only for the king. The others go elsewhere. Here the steps are covered with copper and the king's steps are platinum. As he climbs the staircase less often, Whew. They're checking our admission tickets. This is the central tower. So this is the highest building in the, uh, in the courtyard. So this is the first courtyard. This belongs to administration. So here is all office. You can see uh, health and education office. Then there is like fire section. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, different, different uh, sections, like agriculture and everything. And now we are moving towards the monastic site. You can't film inside, but I have recorded the audio with this magic player for you to listen to.
Of course, no national happiness is possible without a healthy attitude towards sex. In Bhutan, there is no problem with this. There might even be too much. There's a real cult in the country. Penises are painted on houses, figures hang from ceilings, and are even considered a symbol of happiness, prosperity, and fertility. No wonder one of Bhutan's main heroes is Drupka Kunli, a lustful Buddhist monk. He's called the saint of 5,000 women. Supposedly, this is the number of women the monk has managed to make happy during his lifetime. Assuming he had a sex life for 40 years, for each feat he'd have to change partners every three days. Well, and the main feat of this saint was that he literally killed a local demoness by having sex with her too hard. The monk died in the 16th century, but his memory lives on. For example, in this Chimi Lakang temple, among other things, there is a staff with which Drupka came to Bhutan from Tibet to preach Buddhism. The tip of the staff, of course, is also shaped like a penis. People come for these penises. Here you can sanctify wooden penises to hang at home. You can also get hit on the forehead with the 25 centimeter lingam. For a blessing, of course. So if you write penis on a fence in Bhutan, it's not vandalism, but a manifestation of religious sentiments and piety. Well, as for all of this, it's actually quite an art in a good way, because here, penises have eyes, teeth, wings, feet. I mean, there are all kinds of penises that people draw here. And about the 25 centimeter metal penis, there are actually monks that go around and slap you on the forehead with it. That's how they bless you, for all kinds of feats. They also come here to choose the name of their child. It's also quite an interesting procedure. The parents come to the monk with a set of cards. There are all kinds of different names, and the monk picks a card at random. That's what their child will be called. As I mentioned, Bhutan is the last Buddhist kingdom in the world. Here, Buddhism influences everything from the concept of natural happiness to attitudes toward nature. The constitution guarantees the Buddhist freedom of faith, and you can get up to three years in jail for forcing a change of faith. But Buddhism is recognized as Bhutan's cultural heritage and is protected by law. The absolute majority of the population professes Tibetan Buddhism, which was in the country from 2nd century AD. It was recognized as the country's official religion as early as the 7th century. Since then, Bhutan has lived largely according to Buddhist principles, and the preservation of traditions is part of Bhutanese policy, not only in religion, but also in architecture. The main unit of Bhutanese architecture is the Dzong, a building with massive walls and towers that combines the functions of fortress, monastery, university, and government center. The Dzongs are built by the Bhutanese under the direction of the Lama, or the Buddhist master. The rules for the construction of Dzongs, as well as other buildings, are written down in the, in the Driglam Namza, a set of rules of behavior and etiquette. And in 1988, a royal decree was issued requiring all buildings to have multicolored wooden facades, arched windows, and a multi-pitched roof. Traditional Bhutanese houses are built with frame walls, and the space between the wooden panels is filled and tamped with soil, and swastikas and penises are drawn on the walls as symbols of the sun and fertility. However, they say that now the construction sites have started to hire guest workers, making it difficult to enforce the rules. Driglam Nansa also regulates dress codes. All men are required to wear a traditional dressing gown and have a pocket in front of the robe, and women must wear colored blouses a special fabric that covers the legs down to the heels. Now let's talk about the national dress. Here, the men wear these luxurious dressing gowns. Go, don't they? It's go. In the past, these gowns were compulsory as part of the national code of compulsory dress. You couldn't enter an establishment without wearing it. Now these rules have been relaxed a bit. Not so many people wear these gowns anymore. In the villages and in the provinces, practically everybody does, but in the cities, only about 30 to 40 percent of the people wear them. But as mentioned, guides, drivers, hotel staff, waiters in restaurants, and any other service personnel, they wear these gowns. It's actually incredibly comfortable, because basically this luxurious gown... 
Ooh, I've lost a lot of weight. You can almost see my waist now. And there are pockets, and in this pocket you can put anything. A wallet, some small pouches, a phone. You can put a baby in. So, it's an incredibly amazing dressing gown. Underneath the dressing gown, of course, here must be bare legs and long stockings and shoes underneath. I'm not going to embarrass you with my stockings, so I'm in jeans. It's not 100% perfect, but I look more or less decent now. Next, there's also a scarf that goes with the outfit. Wow, quite the groom. Now I can go to a reception for, I don't know, the king or a minister? So only two types of scarf, is a white and yellow? No, minister will have orange. Minister orange? Orange, and then our parliament member will have blue. Blue. In court of justice, there are judge, no judge, mm -hmm. and then they have green. Mm -hmm. Then our governor will have a white with a red stripe. Mm -hmm. So there are, and then there are different, like with fringes, it's like for common people, some have fringes, and then some have white, but no fringes. That is for like some secretary and all that things. So there are, it shows the rank, ranking mm -hmm. in this. It makes it easy to understand who is in front of you. You have to look at the scarf. I, being an ordinary person, have the white one with fringes, or whatever it's called. Well, it's for ordinary people. The yellow scarf is the most luxurious because the king has the yellow one. And here, in my pocket, I can put oil, uh, toothpaste, and some deodorant in it. And that's it. It's very comfortable, and you can go around without a backpack, without bags, like a kangaroo. I hope I haven't offended anyone now, because it really is like a kangaroo. Happy life in Bhutan is according to ancestral traditions, and so is death. When someone dies in Bhutan, their family goes to an astrologer, who tells them what to do. According to the rules, they have to make sure that 108 poles with white flags are put up. Obviously, this rule is not very strict, but people try to follow the tradition. So, on the flags are written prayers that the wind will carry to the four sides. The astrologer looks at the date of birth, the date of death, studies the life of the deceased, and tells the relatives where it is best to place these poles. The body itself is burnt and the ashes are mixed with the white clay and made into 108 small pillars, which are then fired and painted. Sometimes the astrologer may ask for more or less pillars to be made. It all depends on the birth and death numbers. A note with the name of the deceased is placed at the base of each pillar. They are placed in a shelter so that they, they do not erode in the rain. They are everywhere, along roadsides, in temples, in caves, under rocks and trees, and so on. So here uh, we are you see seeing them? somebody hoisting prayer flag. So I just inquired them and then they are hoisting prayer flag for some deceased one. So in Buddhism we believe in the transfer of consciousness, like we only change our body, our mind will keep on continuing from changing one body to another, like one human to another human, or one a or human to animal, or animal to human, so it keeps on continuing. This is kind of like gesture to repay their kindness, or to uh, wish to pray for the deceased consciousness, uh, for like a swift transfer from present body to another body. So it's kind of like accumulating merit. This is the uh, hoisting of prayer flag. Make play, uh, flags and then? Yes, then they will put uh, wherever there is a secluded places. For example, here there are a lot of uh, Buddhist monuments like uh, stupa and then prayer wheel. So this is a good place to hoist prayer flag. Yeah. Uh, they can put it uh, uh, where they want or somebody tells uh, them? Uh, uh, the they can put it uh, wherever they, uh, they want, but there are some restricted places like they cannot put near the power lines 
where there is a, a naked power lines and then they can put it on the mountains they can uh, put it near the rivers they can put it near the near such kind of buddhist monuments so uh, they choose a place by the, uh, themselves yes uh, but they, sometimes like the uh, places are cho uh, places are chosen by the people living sometimes like uh, places are um, uh, chosen by those who passed away like there are we have to uh, consult an astrologer or somebody who knows astrology so there are particular days there are some days we cannot hoist the prayer flag there are some days we can hoist the prayer flag but today is a good day to hoist prayer flag so first they will prepare everything then after they hoist the prayer flag then he will perform the uh, cleansing ceremony He, he know astrology. Uh, he knows astrology also. Okay. He okay. might have knowledge of astronomy. This is family, and uh, they came to him and uh, asked him yes, to yes. make the ceremony. The ceremony, yes. And they they pay him. Yes. Uh, yes they pay him. How much? Uh, the uh, no, there is no fixed uh, fixed amount. It depends on the family, like how much they want to offer yeah, to usually be, it's uh, usually like it can be like thousand uh, nil term or like 800 nil term mm -hmm. uh, actually i asked them and then this is kind of like anniversary so somebody passed away so somebody passed away two years back so this is the three years anniversary. This is like remembrance of somebody mm -hmm. is, uh, who passed away. Traditions and traditions, but Bhutan also likes modern trends like ecology, especially since it's on the list of things that determine Bhutan's national happiness. Bhutan is probably the greenest country in the world. Back in 2005, Bhutan declared that it will be carbon neutral, or it will not produce more carbon dioxide than it destroys. Yes, while the world talks about carbon neutrality as a bright future, in which global warming will be stopped, Bhutan has long since achieved this goal. And it's even ahead of schedule. Bhutan is now not just carbon neutral, it's carbon negative. The country's energy is based on hydroelectric power plants on mountain rivers. And they have so much electricity from the rivers that they even sell it to neighboring India. Behind me are two wind turbines. They are, they are the only two wind turbines in Bhutan. And as, as they explain here, it's a kind of test project. They have put up just two right now, but they're going to see how it works. If it works well, they'll add more. It's very windy here. Can you see it? I don't know, I hope it sounds okay. But the wind is quite strong here, and probably if you put wind turbines on the mountain slopes, you can get some energy. By the way, there is a certain quota of electricity here that people get for free. That is, up to a certain consumption. As I understand, it differs slightly from one region to another. Generally, the electricity is free, but if you are very posh and consume a lot, then you have to pay for it. But even so, electricity here is very cheap both for ordinary people and companies. And to all this beauty, I'll have to add a little spoonful of tar, because all the time you are in Bhutan, you read amazing reports about its carbon neutrality, ecology, how everything is amazing and wonderful here, how happy people are. You get the impression that it's at least as good as Switzerland, or even better. Then you come here, you start to look closer, and you feel the trap. For example, one of these turbines isn't working. There are leaks everywhere. Cables are down to the ground. The road leading to these turbines is destroyed. The gates are rusted. It's like that everywhere. You read about the incredible ecology, but then you see plastic bottles, and you ask yourself a question. Can they position themselves as paradise on Earth? Can't they do something about rubbish like European countries do? It's like that with every indicator of success in Bhutan. And if you look closely, here they say we have no carbon footprint. We have negative carbon footprint, but they don't have any industry. Everything comes from Indian factories. No, they built their hydroelectric plants. They generate a lot of power. They sell the excess power to India, and that's what they live off. It's all for show, for tourists. 
There's no industry here. The local factories are a medieval entertainment for tourists. They don't do anything serious. They buy everything off of others. It's clear that they do well with their carbon footprint, but if you come to an ordinary house, you will see that in an ordinary house there are most likely no amenities. It's likely to be heated with an old-fashioned firewood. There's likely to be not much nice different food, but everywhere there's a portrait of the favorite king who makes the Bhutanese people happy or makes them think that they are. I wasn't too impressed by the local wind turbines and I wasn't able to visit the hydroelectric power station. They say the local state is very protective of it and won't let anyone into its famous power station on the mountain rivers. But I did get to the 108 stupa memorial. It was erected in honor of the soldiers who died during the operation against the Assam rebels in 2003. It is said that the king himself was in the battle on an equal footing with the others. Of course, it is hard to believe that this isn't just another Bhutanese legend. Well, at least the stupas in honor of the fallen are quite real. So this is the Doshala Pass. Before 2004, it was an ordinary pass. That is, a place where you can cross from one mountain valley to another. This is one of the passes between Timpu and Wegdu, Podrang. Now there are 108 stupas here. It looks beautiful. It's an amazing place. And what is this? Who dumped the rubbish here? And these are like people. Who live it? Is it tourists or local people? Uh, it can be local people as well as uh, some uh, visitors also. Why nobody clean this place? Uh, we clean it, but still uh, they keep on. But uh, it's better now. However, they continue to litter one after another. Plastic bottle pops up here or there. <laughs> Well, you're probably tired of all these Bhutanese myths and legends, so I'm going to show you the real Bhutan as the locals see it. This is what a simple peasant's house looks like. There's a kitten. Here they have a little shop where they sell soft drinks, coke, oil. It's a simple little shop. By the way, there's a lucky horseshoe. Hi. How many people live here? And all of you is one family. So uh, you live in this room? Yes. Six of you? It's a house made of plywood. Actually, this is like kind of like temporary shelter for them. Mm -hmm. They are all from south, like southern uh, district. It is known as Chuka. But what do they do here in Karo? Here to do work. So they are all... What kind of work? They are all doing uh, like construction work. Okay, so uh, I think it, it's, uh, there's no no window. <laughs> no glass, no yeah. glass in the window, so only this. Yeah. But uh, at night it's uh, very, uh, very cold, so how... Any heater they have or... How they sleep here? Broken by us. Okay, and where is a uh, king's portrait? Uh, they have the... But it's not the a king. Leader of the like, religious... Where is the royal family? No. Uh, no? No, because this is like kind of temporary yeah. shelter uh -huh. for them. Who play guitar? Can you play? Yes. Thank you. It's like this small house with a small shop and few rooms. It's a cold house, no windows, with walls made of plywood. I have no idea what happens at night because at night it's minus two or minus five degrees. So it's very cold. But the kids live, study, and work here on the construction site. It is their temporary accommodation. Who are like skilled mason. Mm -hmm. They are paid 1,200 in a day. In a day. Yeah. Eight to five. 
and then in between mm -hmm. one hour lunch break. Mm -hmm. And then then there's uh, we what call we call them, helpers, uh, which has unskilled labor. Like unskilled uh, they are paid workforce. Mm -hmm. Nine dollars and eighty like cents a day. Or eight hundred per. Now let's see what a real farm looks like. Uh -huh. There's a hand mill. They make the whole ladder out of one log. In this case, there are several logs. The staircase is quite steep. There are two posts on the sides, like handrails, because without them, you can't climb such a staircase. It's a rather strange solution. In my opinion, it's much easier to make a standard Russian ladder with separate steps. Oh, and up he goes. You can see that this ladder isn't really comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here you always have to take off your shoes. There's a smaller staircase. Living room, cooker, antiques. Block print for the flare flag. <laughs> now they are printing by machine, but past they use this one <laughs> and then the black suit from the fire to make ink and then they print here okay. and then these are all utensils mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this is for making butter tea mm -hmm. then this is for making ara ara is known as moonshine mm -hmm. moonshine this is another room this is traditional boot this is all uh, leather and then this is cloth, so those days we don't have shoes, manufactured sh shoes, so people came up with mm -hmm. it. So this is the most important room in the house. So this is uh, like sleeping room, so here you can see the base at night. They will look. And then this is the altar room. So we have, so here the rituals and then uh, prayers are done here and then they do offerings mm -hmm. in the morning and then they collect it, that is seven bowl of offering water and then they collect it in, at night and then this is for seat for life. There are pictures of the king everywhere. Very authentic Buddhist house. This is what is upstairs. <laughs> Can you walk? Yeah. Okay. Так и я пошел наверх. Так. I made it up this amazing staircase. They're drying meat here. And this is what the attic looks like. Again, this is a very traditional Bhutanese attic. Here is the house itself, the roof, and between the roof and the living space, there is about another half floor. In our understanding, it would be an attic. Here, it's open, because in the attic they usually put hay, dry some meat, and so on. It has to be well ventilated. If we look at almost every house, we see that there is always a space between the roof and the upper floor. That is, even when they build some hotels or modern buildings, they still leave air between the roof and the building itself, because this is also part of Bhutanese architectural tradition. There are these fantastic pine beans. They are very thick. And 
Here is the neighboring house. And in all the houses, it's more or less the same. The roof on the top, of that there's the attic, roof, attic, roof, attic. And it's interesting because some people use the ground floor for storage. They keep some kind of livestock there. We have this in Russia, everything is downstairs. And the Bhutanese take everything to the attic. By the way, the roof is very simple, as it only serves the function of protecting from moisture. There's no need to insulate anything. Everything is quite primitive. The main thing here is that water doesn't drip through. Here you can see how thick the walls are. The walls are made of some kind of cement, like homemade clay. Well, clay, just clay mixed with sand, yes. And it's tamped by hand and nothing else. Then when it hardens, they take it off. They do the next layers. Oh, they have a proper ladder here. This is a traditional ladder. In Bhutanese houses, it is cold. For warmth, there is a bathhouse, which is nothing like the Russian banya or Finnish sauna. Of course, I couldn't miss the opportunity to have a Bhutanese bath. So keep the kids away from the screens. It's going to be hot. And this is the Bhutanese bathhouse. They pick up a stone. They have to wash it. They put stones in the water. Here are the stones. You sit there and the steam comes out. It's like a hammam bath. This is what the traditional Bhutanese bath looks like. Look, I really don't understand how it works. I mean, it's cold in there. There are holes everywhere. How hot is it supposed to get? Do you reckon it'll get hot? This is what a bathhouse looks like in Bhutan. It gets a bit hot. They throw stones in the water, and the main problem with these stones is as with some drugs, you take to change your consciousness is that the effect doesn't happen immediately. They put more and more stones in. They ask if it's okay. They put more and more stones in. They ask if it's okay. You say it's fine and then you realize that it's hard to sit down. It's just a hot bath. But if you don't have a hot bath, you can come to a Bhutanese bath. Look at the sky through the holes, at the cobwebs, and enjoy the warmth. Especially when it's relatively cool outside. Well, on that hot note, we can leave Bhutan. Well guys, that was Bhutan. Such an amazing and closed country. I hope you had fun. Don't forget to like, subscribe, write a comment for the YouTube algorithms. They really like it. So as many people as possible will see the video. Also, don't forget to share this video on Reddit and send the link to your friends via WhatsApp. Goodbye.